Um, hi, I'm Nick Richards. I'm here to talk about product management and open source. Uh, I've been a Ghanaian user for what I disappointingly found uh, as I was writing this talk is 20 years. Um, and a contributor and foundation member for 10 years on and off in various different methods. Um, I'm also a flat hobbyist in very many ways, so if you want to know more about that, come and talk to me or one of many other people. Uh, previous excellent talks you may have seen by me in the uh, Guadalajara of Desktop Summit. I claimed that extensions were going to rule the world, and I was correct, obviously. It's the main way to deliver high quality value <laughs> and uh, differentiated experiences. Um, I've also worked on uh, a variety of Galen derivatives, such as this uh, exciting uh, user interface filled with Clutter and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, this slide also shows you one of the key things that you need to see, which is uh, calculate as many cats as you can in your presentation and see the ratio of pictures of cats to Christian. <laughs> so, I'm a product manager at Endless. Uh, don't worry if you don't know what that means, that is literally the point of the talk to tell you. Uh, so, you may know who Endless are, they're out of shop down here on the right, which is kind of disappointing. <laughs> so, um, Endless loves GNOME. Uh, we build products based on GNOME. GNOME is the thing that all of our users see, it's our app developer experience. Um, it's, uh, it's probably one of the most important projects that, uh, that we see in the whole Linux computing space. And so I'm always delighted to be here and uh, always happy to be here. Again. So, what is a product manager? Christian knows what a product manager is. <laughs> he wrote a really helpful blog post about it. He says, product managers are responsible for taking information and feedback from everywhere, basically, and converting that into a coherent product direction and forward-looking vision. They analyze common issues, bug velocity and features to ensure reasonable milestones and it keeps the product functional as it transforms it into its more ideal state. Most importantly, this role is leadership. So, that is for the PDF and the slides. You should definitely read this blog post. Basically, most of this talk you could have got by reading that last year. You should have done. I think the most important thing to say about product management is it's the role you go into. There aren't too many people who start off doing product management. So if you are a, uh, a new company to go, don't think this is a thing you should be doing now. Um, it's a thing that you know, I've done all different kinds of things. I'm a designer, I've worked writing specifications, I've done different kinds of things around technology. Um, and one of the things about that, taking input from everywhere, that's really important, is that you kind of need to have a little bit of experience in a lot of things, uh, both to know when people are talking bollocks um, to you or trying to pull the wool over your eyes, um, but also so that you can really empathize and feel what they feel, and feel their pain, understand the things that drive them and that want, want them to make the best products that they possibly can. So what does a product manager actually do? The most important thing that you do in this kind of role, the leadership type role, is you tell the story. You to explain to people what the product is supposed to be, what the vision is, what you're supposed to be doing, and as you say, transforming into the ideal state. So that means you have to know what the ideal state is and be able to tell people what it is. To be able to explain to them why this stupid bug fix they have to do on a Tuesday afternoon or in order to get this point release out is actually transforming the product into a more ideal story. Now it makes people's lives better every day or occasionally or it doesn't make you look embarrassing. Any one of these uh, things is, uh, is a good excuse. You need to integrate all of the things, as I've said. You need to be able to bring together a wide array of different uh, input and turn that into that story. Um, it's no use that just coming out with that with your gut or with just one bit of intuition. You need to be humble and able to, uh, yeah, let's say, integrate all of these things. And you need to maintain standards. You know, that's, that's the other kind of point about that issue. You need to know this is good enough, this isn't good enough. Um, this is you know, one of the big things in open source projects in particular. Um, but it's just as true if you work in, uh, in fact, maybe even more true if you work in proprietary software or in uh, other uh, companies. Um, you know, people are always trying to get the absolute minimum possible done, and often that minimum is less than the bar needs to be at. Um, so particularly if you're trying to tell a story that's very ambitious, uh, accepting less than ambition is um, not always helpful. So what this role comes down to in a lot of cases is you have to say no in an encouraging way. Um, if, you, if you just say no to people enough, they will go away. Um, and that's not what you want. You need, you need people on board, you need people to share that vision, to be excited about the thing. <coughs> Does this sound a little bit like the job in free software maintainer? 
<laughs> it does rather, doesn't it? I mean, kind of, that's sort of what I'm here to tell you to a large extent is why should you care you do this already, right? But by and large, you've been kind of doing that by just taking these roles on or by people showing up and asking you difficult questions or questions in ways that are kind of difficult to understand and you have to sort of make these mistakes by falling down the tree and hitting all the branches. It's not as fun. But why should you care? Question again. For the past three years, I've been working very hard, and it's now four years, and he's still been working really hard. <laughs> because he fulfills a number of roles for Builder. Um, it's exhausting and unsustainable, and it contributes to burnout and hostile communications by seeing, putting too much responsibility to too few people's shoulders. Um, I think that's the real message here I want to bring, is that uh, just because you're doing everything on your own doesn't mean you have to do everything on your own. It's great to share. But the question kind of is, okay, you might want to bring someone in to help to, uh, take some of this pain off you, but do you actually want to give up control? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's because Christian is mature and a talented software developer. <laughs> so that. Does everyone also always want to give up control? Maybe you don't. That can be okay. We'll, we'll see a bit more on that. But you have to actually want to do this thing in order to do it. Like just saying, oh yes, we want designers to show up, but I want to do all the design myself is not necessarily a way of handing stuff over. Which kind of projects need project, uh, project management? So one of the key things here is cross-cutting initiatives. Okay, So GNOME Goals are a good example of this. Um, but there's a whole variety of cross-cutting initiatives where coordination between lots of different projects makes sense. So no one maintainer can know all about this. So you could say privacy initiatives where something that goes all the way down to the bottom of the stack has to be expressed in multiple different areas across the thing. At the moment, our design team does a lot of this work. Um, they do a great job in ensuring coherence and consistency. Um, but there's a bunch of other stuff here, like the developer experience, right? At the moment, we don't really have a developer experience. We have a series of things that are things that developers do, but they're all kind of in their little silos, right? And they're great in their silos, and we're doing really, really well there, but we haven't really got this overall vision. So cross-casting initiatives, really, really helpful if you have someone coordinating that kind of work. The other things, uh, exactly, yeah, these are areas where you need a strategic vision. So you can't just get there by iterating. You have to know where you're trying to get to. And the other, th the other kind of area where product management is really helpful are these bigger projects. Okay, So these are projects where there is a lot of ambition, where there is a lot of feature, where there's a lot of surface area around the thing. And it's kind of... Some of these, some of the projects that are GNOME projects, we don't have so much, so much uh, ambition necessarily. Maybe uh, I don't want to call too many people out for a lack of ambition, <laughs> but um, but maybe the scope of the project is smaller. It can be clearly understood, and it, maybe it can be just done by one person. Right? That's cool. Um, you know, my good friend Mario, he's been working on uh, a sort of a homebrew personal project with Frogger for uploading photos to Flickr for the last few years. Right? It's a great project. Its scope is just one thing. He's done it, he's basically made it almost perfect. I was going to say perfect, but then he needed to improve one thing, which is he's fixed, there'll be a new release soon. Um, but it, the, the, point of, uh, the point of this project for him was about learning how to use all of the tools. And so it was important that it was a just one person project because he wanted to learn how to use the GUI. He wanted to understand more about the design. He wanted to understand more about the networking stack. That's not every project here. Like some of these bigger projects, Builder, for example, uh, has crazy ambition. You know, you can talk to some of the people who now work for uh, other competing developer tools companies and think about how many people work on, you know, Visual Studio, how many people work on Xcode, how many people work on Android Studio. And the amazingness of Gnome and the tools and the team that we have is how close we've got to these kind of experiences with very much more limited resources. Um, the share is also a very big project. Yeah, so your project may not yet have the ambition to be big. Um, that can be okay. But if you do, how can you find a vision? And I'd love actually more projects to be more ambitious. Um, I think one of the things that is a great theme for me about this Guadalc, um, and especially coming on the, uh, the heels of uh, the inspirational, exciting talk about the foundation and uh, sort of the wider scope here, is that I think GNOME has the possibility of being much, much more ambitious than we have in the past. But if you do, how do you find your vision? As I was saying before, um, it's really important to have a vision. If your vision, as far as you're concerned, is just show some photos, 
in a, in a grid <laughs> or a treaty. That's not really kind of a vision that excites people or does stuff. But you know, a vision in this kind of case could be, hey, um, it, it would be great if I could find all of these photos of my daughter. Right? Right. So how can, you, how can you get to this point where you, can, where, where you can express a vision which is amazing, which has a clear technical backing where you might want to have some face recognition that is privacy preserving, that you might want to be able to sort stuff in a really innovative and uh, cool fashion. Well, so what you're looking for here is a mix of internal drive and user satisfaction and sort of user needs. So some of this stuff has to come from you. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, I always reject uh, overly, um, overly dry and statistics laden uh, product elements. Um, I think that the, uh, the gut and the kind of the feel of what is right, uh, particularly as you, as you grow and you spend more time in this type of stuff is really, really important. But you also have to be really aware of what is actually working. Um, and again, you know, talking to, uh, <laughs> listening to Shree's talk, I, mean, I think all of these, these talks in this track here are really um, in dialogue with each other and a really interesting question about how we, uh, how we can listen to users in a respectful fashion. Yeah. So question one is, whose feedback should you listen to? Incorrect answer. You should have asked question zero, how do you get feedback in the first place? <laughs> So, is the first way you get feedback by reading the rules? <laughs> yeah. Is it by reading Twitter? Okay. Is this the feedback that you're uh, that you're getting? Is it by listening to cats? It's always my favourite answer. Now, there's a lot of different ways. You can get feedback in person. You can send loves. You can come to Guadalajara and talk to people. You can go into the field, as we at Endless do a lot, and go and listen to users uh, in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you can get them from GitLab, from Bugzilla, you can get them from IRC. Uh, press reviews are a really good source of feedback from people who aren't necessarily as embedded within your community but understand a lot of different stuff. Uh, blogs, uh, forums, you know, I mean, there is some legitimate feedback that can come by these things. User testing is another really, really important thing. I know there's been a lot of talk about how we can expose some of the user testing that um, can only contribute to companies to, to the rest of the, uh, the wider community. Um, that can always be difficult to do. Privacy preserving fashion. The thing I want to say is great products never listen in just one way. Okay? You can always be slightly more biased in one way or another. So, you know, historically, Apple products have listened to whatever Steve Jobs thought was the right answer, and he had great taste, and it pretty much always was the right answer. You look at other companies like Facebook, where they really, really optimize themselves into a, a situation where they just do what the metrics say. You know, we, we changed this shade of blue and more people clicked on it, so we're going to keep doing that kind of thing. Okay? I don't think that particularly for GNOME and particularly for projects that release as slowly and as distributed as widely as we are, um, but that makes sense. You, but you have to integrate all of these things if you possibly can. One of the things I will say that we find really useful at Endless uh, is we have access to metrics. I'm aware that metrics are a really controversial topic, um, particularly making them privacy preserved. One of the things I can tell you from these metrics, though, is that Nautilus is the most used application <laughs> from endless users in the last 30 days, right? Now, when I, you know, kind of, when I first joined Endless, and looked at these, before I looked at these metrics, this is not what I would have assumed, right? <laughs> I, would have, I would have assumed a wide variety of different things. I'd have thought photos, maybe. I'd have thought communications applications, like evolution or stuff like this. But actually, it turns out that our users, um, and this may be different if you're System76, this may be different if you're Purism. This may be different uh, if you're Dell, right? Or uh, Canonical. Um, our users really, really like to understand uh, com computing by the metaphor of the farm manager, okay? So that's actually really driven a lot of the investment that we've done in the past around uh, optimization and improvement. Um, and we really care about making sure that the Nautilus community uh, feels the love and understands what endless users want, okay? So we make an extra effort to each other. But that's something that I wouldn't have known necessarily otherwise, apart from maybe, again, if I'd have listened to Sri saying, wow, this topic's really weirdly controversial, right? <laughs> so again, that's another way that you could have got this. Metrics aren't the only way you could have heard this. You could have heard this by talking to your engagement people and going, there's a lot of people who seem to really care about this. And you're like, oh, okay, these two things come together and then you, you start to see where something's important. So Glenn has strong privacy guarantees. Um, and possibly more importantly, uh, intermediating forces. Okay, very few people get GNOME stuff directly from GNOME. Okay, you know it's always comes through a distributor like Endless. Right? We uh, we change things. Uh, maybe we strip stuff out. 
Debian certainly would make no bones of stripping out a lot of this kind of stuff, right? And that would be great. That's what their community wants, and that's what people need. So I'm not saying the metrics are the be all and end all, but they are an interesting signal that I think we should really consider. Where possible, though, the Galen community should attempt to disintermediate these intermediaries. Um, I think it's really, really important that developers can go directly to their end users and hear from them. So one of the most important ways of doing that, in my experience, for application developers, um, is the new containerized uh, uh, application delivery formats like Flatpak and stuff. I think it's, we should we should really be trying to make the most out of getting directly to users with the configuration supported uh, configuration that we have. And this also does a bunch of user research. So user research is another amazing way of seeing how people don't understand what you're doing. <laughs> um, there are two kinds of user research. There's a kind of user research where you stand behind a what two way or one way mirror, hopefully. Sometimes it's <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, and then you watch someone use your software, or maybe you see a video of it later uh, if, if it's been recorded. Um, and that can be really good at getting like a first impression. So again, more useful for application developers. I strongly recommend recommend that as possible. In the shell, that software you use literally all the time, and maybe Nautilus again, that software you use all the time. You've built up muscle memory. You've, you've experienced a lot of this. Uh, finding out what and a bunch of people find their first five minutes using the software is kind of important, but it doesn't actually tell you how important it might be to focus on shaving an extra eighth of a second of that animation because it gets really irritating after day 20. Um, doing that kind of longitudinal and harder user research is really expensive, and that's the kind of thing that fundamentally the GNOME community as it's currently uh, instituted can't afford to do. Um, it would be great if we could have more money <laughs> and do more of this kind of thing. So please continue to donate. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. So product can do that. Yes. I think that's the important part here. I've talked about a load of stuff that product managers don't actually do. Right? I've talked about designing. I've talked about programming. I've talked about all of this kind of stuff. Product is part of a big software team. So that's why big projects and cross-cutting initiatives kind of tend to work there. Because if I just sit on my own, uh, I'm not going to get a lot of software done. So, who are some people who, can, who form part of the software team? So, there's a taxonomy of some stuff that Christian came up with, some stuff that I was thinking of. So, developers. Developers come with a multitude of sins, don't they? <laughs> so, but we'll kind of leave that there for now. Some more specific ones will come up later. Interaction designers. They, make, they help you make software. They're really, really useful for some stuff. Your quality assurance people. Your tech writers. Your user support. Graphic designers. Need those items. Security engineers, really, really important. We don't have enough of them working in the free software community. Build engineers, we do thankfully have a lot more of them now than we used to. This is this is awesome. This has really helped us drive quality and improvements um, in GNOME. Optimization engineers, again, something that we are starting to uh, starting to really focus on around bringing those extra uh, extra bits of performance out of the system that we have. User and developer advocates, again, the engagement team does a great job here. But I'd like to. So it's maybe a diff difference between just a user advocate, but also developer advocates. You know, we have lots of different audiences, um, particularly application developers, uh, so the people who consume the stuff that we have as well as... Um, Hackfest organizers. It's really, really important. These things don't just necessarily organize themselves, and they're really uh, critical for bringing the teams together. Product marketers, subtly different to product managers. <laughs> they, uh, they, they help position your, uh, position your product to understand the relationship between the rest of the um, the rest of the market around that and, and how you're uh, the, the stuff you're making. Operations people, we really, really don't want our services to fall over, particularly as we start making things that uh, that stay up, that work remotely, that are internet connected. User research, mentioned beforehand, kind of important. Release managers. Release managers, again, a, a massively under uh, underappreciated job. Uh, again, we have got some we got some great release team in the Galen community that um, on your on your own. It's the job you have to do. Public relations, again, subtly different to a user advocate or all of that. That's people who are maybe talking to the press. Standards committee members. This is again, this is something we don't have at all really within the Galen community. Uh, this is a, one of the big reasons why uh, sort of sister organisations like Mozilla exist so that they can exert um, influence on internet standards. And, and make sure that the rest of the, the whole software 
ecosystem is bent towards for you. Infrastructure engineers. You know, GitLab doesn't write itself, guys. It's, uh, and the more we want to make work on it, the more we want to do it. And um, you could have called them backend en engineers and all this kind of stuff. It's a subtly different part of, uh, of software work. Localizers. Notice the yes. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Internationalizers. That's a really, really long list of stuff. Okay. Now, you, we, if you listen to this, we probably have pretty much all of these things somewhere within the Gnome community. Not every project has all of this, um, and not every proprietary project has all this. Teams are built out of different things, but we really need to try and build and bring these people inside our community because this diversity of opinion um, and this diversity of expertise is what's going to take us to drive us um, much, much better than we possibly can do at the moment. Because uh, I know that I'm really bad at a lot of these things, and I'll end up doing them if no one else does. We should be better. So yeah, product without scale is kind of lonely and pointless. Um, don't go into this if you don't like working with other people. Uh, but a lot of this means that we have to think about attracting people with skill sets that we don't know about. Like, you know, this, this question uh, that, that was brought up in the previous thing. How do you interview for people where, <laughs> when you don't know what they're, they're good at and when you don't know how to, to do all of these kind of things? I don't have a great answer to this, and we don't really have a great answer to all of this. But I have some kind of tips that I can think a little bit about. So sit around and wait for them to do it is not a tactic that has worked very well for us in the past. Um, you know, it's, it's always been uh, a great one when people say, oh, this thing needs more design. You know, you just wait, sit around and wait for someone to come by and redesign your product. That designer doesn't really know much about the thing. Like, you know, you, we need to think about ways of bringing people on board. Uh, you know, Love has been a great example of this, but across all of these different skill sets, think about what's the smallest possible interaction someone can have to get involved in your community. You know, it's one of the reasons why I'm passionate about things like uh, uh, enabling contribution of non-code things such as more recipes, right? You know, you want people to feel an ownership and a, uh, and feel a pathway of contribution to the stuff that they know about and then they can move and grow into things they don't necessarily know about yet. Another important thing is to invite them in by name, right? So to know that we actually know uh, that we want these people to say, hi, design team, hey, go to the open source design room in Fosdem, right? You can go and say, I want, to, I, want to, I want to meet these people, I want to understand what they think and to respectfully listen to them. Another important thing here, I think, is taking their tools seriously. All too often, um, in the free software community, we kind of push people into a, if your workflow doesn't, isn't Bugzilla or Fabricator or GitLab or anything else like that, then we're kind of not interested in doing stuff. And that means that teams or tools that can kind of work just about well enough with these kind of contribution workflows um, just about sort of survive and go on there. But particularly, um, design things and large binary files don't necessarily work so well here. This also has been really tough for us in the user and developer advocate side um, as we basically filed people into Bugzilla and uh, socialized the problems of uh, people not being able to give good bug reports to all the developers. Yes, I believe that means that Gnome should have a discourse-based forum to accept user feedback and then turn that, those things into tickets that can actually be worked on and understood. Uh, we need to filter away Christian again has a really interesting point about user journals um, and uh, sort of developer journals and user support channels. You know, we need to be very clear about how we get our feedback in. GitLab is a great first step in modernizing our infrastructure. Um, I think it's really important for us that this is the end, um, that we think about how each of these different communities can work better. It's really encouraging that the um, uh, that we've been able to use the kind of the swim lanes and boards approach for many of the engagement teams. I'd love to see more ways to do this. I don't know all of the answers here, but it would be great if we get more. All of that will then hopefully make sure that these people we brought in don't go away. So, summing up, everyone's making a product, but you may not need management or product management yet. That can be okay. Uh, it's really, really important to get a diversity of feedback, but be discerning about it. Don't just randomly accept what some local product is called. Uh, if you want new people to join your project, you actually have to do something about it. You can't just sit there and wait for them, um, which is, again, disappointing. Uh, I'd love to sit there and wait and have people do my work for me. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah, we have some time for questions. We do. Oh, that's good. I did this uh, yesterday, that took 50 minutes, so I think it's a lot of great stuff. <laughs> 
Oh, wait, no, no, behind you. <laughs> then you, then you should. <laughs> Come on. Uh, so, I agree with you that product management is, is really great for free software, and even more for now, like this is something I started. However, I think we have struggled to, to get people from, from that. Yes. Like, I don't think there are free software enthusiasts uh, looking for mm -hmm. product management. Like and then for yeah, there may only be one. There may only be one free software enthusiast who's looking at it right now. Sorry, uh, Carlos was saying that uh, we struggle to find um, to find people who want to do all of these things and to maybe understand the free software community. I think that's one of the things about saying um, that this is a role you go into, right? This can absolutely be the kind of thing that an aspire, a designer can aspire to do in the future, a developer, an internationalizer, a user researcher, like anything where you know deeply, but kind of have to dabble in a little bit of other stuff, you're actually really on a path towards becoming that, whether you like it or not. Uh, cool. Thank you very much. If